thanks for watching and supporting my new YouTube channel, which is a great medium, I think, to share stories, a lot of stories that maybe wouldn't have been recorded or have been forgotten in the passage of time. So this afternoon, I'd like to talk about this particular pilot, a Polish pilot, Flying Officer Franciszek Surma, known as Franek. Uh, and it's fair to say, actually, that his story, uh, and indeed my own, are inexorably connected because of this amazing project that my friends and I did back in the 1980s uh, that I'll talk to you about today. Before I, I do that, what I would say is we hear an awful lot about the Poles today. There's a big Polish community in England, in the UK today. That wasn't always the case. Back in the 1980s when we started our work, there were uh, the Polish community was reasonably or comparatively small and kept quite a low profile really. Um, and that was for a variety of reasons, particularly the ex-servicemen, because Poland is still behind the Iron Curtain in the Soviet bloc. So there are still issues with the communist regime, the Soviet regime over there for people who fought for the West. Uh, those that have settled here, they've still got family perhaps in Poland. So, you know, they're, they're really keeping quite a comparatively low profile. And information about the Polish pilots was very difficult to come by, especially in English. And communication with Poland because of the Iron Curtain was erratic uh, and it was very difficult. And of course, you must remember, this is way, way, way pre the internet age. So there was no such thing as email, no such thing as social media, no such thing as smartphones, uh, being able to take videos and photographs and ping these things instantly. It all had to be done through the good old snail mail, through the post. So that's just a little bit of context to explain uh, the sort of background that, that this project started in. Now, to talk about the Surma story, he was born in 1916 at Ribnik near Galkovice, and his parents were peasant farmers. He had three older sisters, and he was a very bright lad, very popular, joined the Polish Air Force, uh, and became a fighter pilot. So the family are immensely proud uh, of young Franek, and he's seen here at the christening of his niece with one of his sisters. Um, it was just uh, absolutely massively proud of this guy. So when war breaks out, coincidentally, 80 years ago, 81 years ago today, the 1st of September uh, 1939, and today is the 1st of September 2020, Franek Surma is flying the PZL high wing monoplane Polish fighter. And bravely though they fought, it was no match for the ME109. So Ultimately, Poland falls and the Polish Air Force is partially formally evacuated via Romania uh, to France, where they become a part of the French Air Force and then fight in France. The France falls. So then through various means, the Poles make their way to England and bolster the numbers in fighter command. So we have very soon a situation where we have two Polish squadrons equipped with Hurricanes, 302 and 303, and also the Czechs of 310 Squadron, and other uh, uh, free pilots from the occupied lands, which included not only Poles, Czechs, Belgians, French, etc. They're embedded in RAF fighter squadrons. So Surma flew with a variety of RAF fighter squadrons during the Battle of Britain period, 151, 607 County of Durham squadron, uh, and he's pictured here at Tangmere, at readiness, at dispersal in September 1940, serving with 607 squadron, and he was in a flight commanded by Flight Lieutenant Charles Bowen, who's on the right there, pictured in a German swim vest, uh, and they're larking about because Surma used to infuriate Bowen, apparently, who was a very senior pilot, flight lieutenant, uh, by calling him his lovely boy. Uh, and uh, they're larking about at dispersal. The photo was taken by Harry Welford, who was also a pilot officer with Surma on that squadron at the time. So 
Um, it, it's a little unique window into the past, a little photograph like that, a little snapshot. So Surma then goes on to fly with 257 Squadron at North Weald, which is Bob Stanford Tuck Squadron. And on the 29th of October 1940, North Weald is attacked low level by ME 109s and uh, Sergeant Girdwood is shot, shot up while scrambling and crashes, is killed in flames. Surma takes off, manages to get the aircraft up and is then hit by Gerhard Schupfel, 3JG26, who was an excellent fighter pilot. I mean, Schupfel has already, earlier in the Battle of Britain on the 18th of August, famously over Canterbury, dispatched four 501 Squadron Hurricanes in two minutes. And if his aircraft hadn't have been covered in oil and debris from his last victim, he could well have gone on to a shot down more whilst 501 Squadron proceeded completely unaware of his presence. So this is a, an exceptional fighter pilot. So Surma bails out. And so the story goes in Larry Foster's book about Bob Stanford Tuck. He's wearing a German flying jacket taken as a souvenir from a German bomber shot down in Poland, floats down by parachute, lands in a pub garden in Matching in Essex, where he's mistaken for a German, unsurprisingly, by a group of free French soldiers who were all for hanging him on the shroud lines of his parachute. And it's only the intervention of Bob Stanford Tuck and his intelligence officer who prevent this from happening. Now, how true the story is, I don't know, because I have to say that I corresponded with Bob Stanford Tuck about this in the 1980s, and he was always quite evasive and never really gave me a yes or no answer as to whether it was true or not. So whether it's a bit of embellishment, I don't know, but it's certainly possible and it's certainly a good story. So Surma survives that, and after the Battle of Britain, he's posted to 308 City of Krakow Squadron. Now, what's happening now his fighter command is reorganised into three squadron wings based around sector stations. The Spitfire takes over as the RAS frontline fighter and there's a new offensive policy. So this is the non-stop offensive where fighter command is going to reach out across the channel and take the war to the enemy. All very political. 21st of June 1941, of course, Hitler invades Russia and after that, the Western Allies are under pressure from the Soviets to open the Second Front, and this was a means of demonstrating to Stalin that although the time isn't ready for the Second Front, we are doing everything possible by night and day in the air to alleviate pressure on the Russian Front. So it's all quite political and it's really hotting up. So in March 1941, Surma is posted to 308 Squadron, which is a Polish squadron. So we're expanding now the number of single nationality squadrons. So we've got more Czech squadrons, more Polish squadrons, etc. the Free French. And he is sent to Baddington near Coventry, which is now, of course, home to the excellent Midland Air Museum, well worth a visit. And they are exchanging their hurricanes for Spitfires. Surma is in action again, uh, with a lot of uh, the, the night blitz is underway, so there's a lot of daytime reconnaissance uh, bombers prowling around over England. He has a third share, I think, if I remember correctly, into a JU-88 around the Coventry Kenilworth area. So it, it's really moving quickly now, and they're, they're converting to Spitfires. And on the 11th of May 1941, Surma takes off in Spitfire R6644, an old aircraft, a Mark 1A, uh, and with Sergeant Vidlarch, they are sent to the Kidderminster area of Worcestershire to intercept what's an X-raid. Now, an X-raid is a, an unidentified plot of an aircraft on a radar screen that the controller doesn't know what that aircraft is. By and large, X-raids invariably ended up being friendly aircraft, but in this, which is what happened on this occasion, in fact. So, having um, flown the patrol and, and identified that uh, this X-ray isn't a threat. The two Spitfires just ex just probably enjoying flying on a lovely Sunday morning and end up over Malvern in Worcestershire, the wonderful Malvern Hills. And you can see the hills here in the background and suddenly the engine of R6644 bursts into flame and Surma steers it away from the town, the Spitfire's flying this way, and there's a 
section of, of uh, rural countryside between Malvern and Worcester, uh, between the villages of Maddersfield and Callow End, and Surma jumps out and the Spitfire, boom, crashes here. Surma floats down by parachute and lands in the garden of this cottage, which is on the junction of Genitree Lane and Hawthorne Lane at Maddersfield. And the first person to him is Vi Farrand, who's a land girl living at the cottage and runs out and there's this airman who's picking up his parachute. And Vi, at first, when he starts talking, is again concerned that he might be German. But it, you can imagine a sleepy place like Malvern, way away from the fighting in the southeast and so on. You know, this is a major event. So you've got people coming from all points of the compass now. You've got Charlie Knight down in the council houses just down the road from where the Spitfire crashed. Charlie always remembered it. He was four years old, left a vivid impression on his memory that here was the um, the first time he'd ever seen an aircraft, the first time he'd ever seen a parachute, and first time he'd ever seen a fire engine. Bill Pritchard, he's driving along in his milk float and a great big piece of Spitfire, boom, lands in the, the road in front of him and he can hear somebody shouting and then he looks up and it's Surma floating over the top of him, telling him to keep away because the ammunition is exploding in the field. Uh, Jack Calder, the, the local Bobby, comes racing down on his bike from the police house in North Malvern, where coincidentally I lived at one time. So it's causing a real sensation having this, this Spitfire crashing. And Surma himself is taken off to nearby Bosworth Farm and the Page family, where he's pictured here, pictured against the barn and with the, the newly born lambs at the farm. Uh, and there he waits for transport back to Baggington. And that's it, off he goes. So shortly after, 308 Squadron is sent to North Holt on the outskirts of London to join number one Polish fighter wing. And from that point onwards, throughout the whole of what was called the season, which is the summer and the good weather period, the, the North Holt wing is heavily engaged in this non-stop offensive and they are flying bomber escort sorties called circuses, massive operations involving a forward support wing of three squadrons of Spitfires, close escort, medium escort, high level cover, withdrawal cover, all kinds of things, just escorting a few bombers to go over there and hit targets like distilleries, factories, uh, airfields, uh, dock installations, and the, the idea of having the bombers in the formation is to lure up the German fighters so they can be met by all these hundreds of Spitfires. Didn't quite work out that way because the Germans had the tactical advantage. There was nothing in France that strategically was going to cripple the German war effort. So the German fighters, like in the Battle of Britain for fighter command, they have to preserve their limited strength whilst concurrently inflicting the greater damage on the enemy. So they would only attack when the circumstances were entirely favourable to them. And in a way that capitalised the advantage, the technical advantages of their Messerschmitt 109, which could leave a Spitfire in the dive because it had fuel injected engine as opposed to a carburetor, gravity carburetor uh, of the Spitfire's Merlin engine that cut out in the dive. So uh, it was very, you know, the, the very fast diving attacks that David Cox of 19 Squadron dubbed the Dirty Dart. So the thing of the, the, all these dogfights and things, really quite actually quite rare. But this is an incredibly uh, intensive period of operations, during which time Fighter Command is actually losing. They're losing an awful lot of experienced pilots, men like Eric Locke, Bob Stanford Tucks later the following year uh, went down on these similar operations. Um, John Mungo Park, Paddy Finnegan, the list goes on. Eventually, Douglas Bader, the man himself, the legless legend, the Tangmere wing leader, is brought down. But it is absolutely relentless. And during this, 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 this incredibly um, uh, high octane, high energy period of operation, Surma is notching up his score and uh, knocking down 109s. So he receives the 
great Polish gallantry medals, the Vichuti Military 5th class, which is on the left, and the Cross of Valor. And this is the medal ceremony at Northolt. This is the pilots of the Northolt wing, all lined up. And this Spitfire here is AB 930 ZFJ, that Surma flew quite often. Um, and it was also damaged with uh, Sergeant Jan Ockroy flying it in September 1941 when it was hit with cannon shells in the tail and badly damaged. But it was repaired and Surma is flying this aircraft on the 8th of November 1941, which is the last big operation of the season. Circus 110, which is a bombing raid to the power station at Lille. So it, it's, it, it all goes wrong that day because 308 Squadron missed the rendezvous with the bombers. The sun is, it is too bright and it's all confusing. And 308 Squadron is on its own and is vectored to the French coast to patrol up and down uh, and wait and see what happens basically. So this is quite a long flight. They're over the Dunkirk area and just towards the end of their patrol time, they're bounced by a strong force of ME 109s from JG 26. Now, on the left here is uh, Jurek Poplowski, who was a close friend of Franek Sermer's, and this is Tadek Stabrowski. They filed combat reports to the effect that they attacked an ME 109 that was shooting down a Spitfire, but then had to break themselves because there were even more 109s falling on them. And of course, they haven't got a lot of petrol to hang around. So when they get back to Northolt, Fanek Surma is missing. And there's no doubt, looking at the records, that he was shot down by Hutman Johannes Seifert of JG26, another very experienced fighter pilot and ace who was himself killed later on, Knight's Crossholder, and so on and so forth. So Surma is missing. And the missing question is something that really moves me. I, I've done a lot of work around missing in action, but, uh, around air crew and uh, soldiers, uh, and I've got some, some more work coming about that that uh, we'll talk about another time. I think it's a terribly sad thing. And my interest in the missing arose because my great-grandfather was missing with the Worcestershire Regiment at Gallipoli in the First World War, uh, and to me as a young child, it just never seemed acceptable to me that nobody could tell me what happened to him. So this question mark when people are missing, it is a terrible thing for families. Now, Surma's name was recorded and is recorded on the Polish Air Force Memorial at North Holt. And many years later in 1985, I came to work at Malvern Police Station when I was a 23-year-old young police officer and I bumped into my old friend Andy Long, who is here, and uh, Andy at the time was only about 19, I think, and Andy lived at Callowen, the village close to where R6644 had crashed, and, and Andy said, um, did you know there was a Spitfire crashed outside Maddersfield Polish Battle of Britain pilot bailed out. And that was it. That was the ping light bulb moment for me. Up to that point, I've been obsessed with the Battle of Britain, obsessed with the, the, the Spitfire and, and read avidly everything about it. But when Andy said that, it was the light bulb moment because right on my doorstep, here was an opportunity to actually physically reach out and engage with and touch the past. And it was just the most incredibly profound thing. So Andy and I formed the Malvern Spitfire team of, of like-minded local enthusiasts to pull off this project. And what we, what we did, we put an appeal in the local paper, we traced loads of eyewitnesses and interviewed them, located the crash site, and this is, uh, we're pictured here with eyewitnesses down at the site, um, but we didn't just want to excavate it. You know, a aviation archaeology was very popular at the time, particularly with the Battle of Britain crash sites in the southeast. And we, we wanted to do something that was that would really put Surma's story on the map. So we organised this big public dig that was promoted over a couple of years 
to raise awareness and raise funds for the Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund, the Wings Appeal, as it was called back then. And it was supported by Malvern Hills Town and District Council uh, and the Polish Embassy uh, and, and, and the Battle of Britain Fighter Association and the Spitfire Society. And it was an incredible thing. And looking back on it now, one of the most incredible things was that by the time we, we actually pulled off the, the whole thing, I think I was only 25, and so it, it, it was a wonderful thing, looking back, that young people have been so inspired and so engaged to do this, and I think that's one of the reasons why we achieve so much support from people. So we, we locate the, the site there using a magnetometer, and on the 12th of September 1987, the team recovers the remains of R6644, and you can see the bits on the table there, possibly. Um, these are the bits there, and this is squadron leader Gandhi Drabinski, Polish ace with a DFC. Squadron leader Ludwig Martel flew Spitfires in the Battle of Britain. And Bob Morris, who was one of our members, who was a, a Spitfire enthusiast through and through, who... Um, was on 66 Squadron in the Battle of Britain himself. So Bob's there chatting to the two uh, Polish pilots about the bits that are recovered. And as you can see, they, they weren't that big. And the, the reason is that Malvern is granite. It's very hard ground. So it's hit the ground and it's just shattered. So there were lots and lots of little bits, loads and loads of engine and, and bits and pieces like this. Uh, and these were presented to me by the team at a function a few years later, and they're very special um, in, in my personal collection. So the biggest piece was the uh, a piston and liner, but there was a lot of it. So this was a great thing. There's the piston and liner, and after it being conserved by Dr. Dennis Williams, who was one of our members and a metallurgist, and on the same day, and most importantly, we had built a small memorial cairn dedicated to Franek Surma opposite the cottage where he landed by parachute. Now, he wasn't killed there, but we felt that because he was missing and because he hadn't got an individual personal marker, we felt that it was entirely appropriate to build something there to remind people of him and to remind people of that incident and be a talking piece locally. So it was an amazing thing because when we walked up the road from the crash site to the memorial, everybody seemed to leave the field and, and I just thought everybody had gone home. We had a fly pass from a 65 Squadron tornado and the Battle of Britain Memorial flight were cancelled because of bad weather. It was a bit blustery. And everybody seemed to leave the field. And I, I thought, oh, that's a shame. Everybody's gone now. And as we walked up the lane and around a bend, Gandhi Drabinsky became a very dear friend of mine, uh, said to me, did it? We, the Poles, were told not to attend the Victory Parade in 1945 because of Stalin. As far as I'm concerned, this is our Victory Parade. We've waited a long time for this. And it, it was such a choked up moment for all of us. And as we walked around the corner, the most incredible sight, the whole lane, wall to wall or hedge to hedge, was packed with people. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people had turned out to watch this. It was amazing. And, and these people, Tadek Christic was the secretary of the Polish Air Force in Great Britain at the time. You've got Gandhi Drabinsky who actually flew at North Hall in 303 Squadron in the Polish fighter wing. When Surma was there, he actually knew him. Uh, and for Ludwig Martel, they were amazed that anybody was even interested in the Poles. And that's a direct contrast to today, where the Poles are very firmly on the map, not least because of the expanded population in this country and the ease of information being available. Not the case back then. So the Poles were absolutely astonished that anybody was interested in giving any attention to them and their wartime efforts and their story. And we were, we were passionately um, determined to see this uh, acknowledged uh, and to give it currency. So when, when this memorial was unveiled and the Reverend Eric Knowles was the local 
ATC squadron chaplain and Eric gave the the address in which I remember him saying that the story of Franek Surma is an example of how to serve our country, our friends and our God. And it was a very moving service that Eric presided over. And this little modest memorial at the time was the only memorial to an individual Polish fighter pilot in the UK. And we are still very proud of that and very proud of it. But the story didn't end there. The conserved items for the Spitfire were first included in an exhibition at Tudor House Museum in Worcester, which was open for three months and received 10,000 vid visitors, after which it was made into a travelling exhibition, which Brian Owen and his team from the museum literally carted all over the country, and it was seen at all kinds of locations, from schools to aviation museums like RAF Cosford, the RAF Museum at Cosford, um, and, and the life of this went on for some considerable time. Now, more recently, Scott Booth has appeared on the scene with his Laguna Spitfire Legacy Project, which, which, which is very similar to this, to what we did all those years ago. And Scott and I are great friends now uh, and really see the synergy between the two. Uh, Scott's got many advantages we didn't have. The, the internet age, things are so different, you can do so much more now, uh, and more power to his elbow. And recently, I have handed over care of the Surma Spitfire items to Scott, so that they can be uh, shared with the public again, and exhibited alongside the Laguna story. So uh, again, this is gonna give Surma currency, and we're gonna get traction for the story through passing it over to someone new who can carry the torch. And I think that's so important. You have to have succession planning in anything. What happens when we're gone and if we haven't handed these stories over to people and we haven't inspired other people to take them forward? It's crucially important. I'm very grateful uh, to Scott for showing the interest and taking taking these bits and, and doing what he's doing. It's wonderful. So. In 92, I was a beat officer in Malvern, and by that time, I'd written up the Surma story, uh, which we published in The Invisible Thread, which uh, is long sold out, so this isn't a sales plug. And um, it, it's, it's what it is, you know. I mean, it was 1992, pre-digital age, um, and I suppose, you know, it, it stood the test of time. But it's the story of, of the Spitfire and all the different pilots identified who flew it, and obviously the Surma story. And um, we, we, what I wanted to do was again, raise awareness and give this story currency through linking it with my work in the community as a beat officer. And I was acutely aware of the problems with, with bored youngsters. So I founded a charity, the Surma Memorial Trust for Youth, and my old friend Mark Postlethwaite, the artist, produced the book cover, this, uh, this image of R6644 being flown by Surma over the Malden Hills. That was produced as a print, and we had numerous Battle of Britain pilots with us that day, probably uh, must have been between 25 and 30, I would think. When we launched it, we borrowed a Spitfire off the air, off the air force and stuck it outside the Abbey Hotel in Malvern, and it, it was just absolutely amazing. We sold twenty five thousand pounds worth of those prints altogether, which uh, were funds that were distributed in Surma's name to projects that were working to improve the quality of life for youth in the local area. So it was a great thing, and it gave it currency. And Dave Pennell. Uh, the late Dave Pennell flew his Spitfire MJ730 that he kept nearby at Staverton in Gloucester uh, over Malden. We brought the absolute town to a standstill and uh, uh, I don't think there was anybody in Malden by the time we finished in the Worcestershire area hadn't heard of Franek Surma and Spitfires. So it was a terrific project. You can see the amount of people that turned up for this. It, it was just great, but it's a long time ago now. Uh, it's nearly 30 years ago. Uh, so there's an awful lot of people out there that have never heard of this project uh, and have forgotten all about it. And these are some of the 
some of the few who came to help us launch it. It was an absolute massive privilege to be to be friends with these people and to have their support. It was absolutely fantastic. Sadly, they're all now deceased and we're in a situation today where we only have one known Battle of Britain pilot alive. So times change. But I really wanted to share this story with you and there's another video, a short clip, that I filmed yesterday, just showing the memorial as it is today and the local area. So we'll put that on YouTube as well. But before I finish this, in the 1980s, I traced uh, Franek Surma's sisters, Elzbieta and Attilia, uh, in Poland. Communication was very difficult because of the language barrier, because of the post. But talking about the missing, I just want to read you to finish an extract of the letter. And more recently, it must be 10 years ago, I revisited the sermon story in Spitfire Voices that was published by Amberley, uh, and I think is, is still available on the second-hand market or, or as a paperback, probably, I, I'm not sure. But, um, but I'll just read you this, uh, and this was one of the most moving letters that I ever had, uh, and this, this was hard on the heels uh, of me having been made an honorary pole at an incredible service uh, ceremony at the Polish Air Force uh, headquarters in, uh, in London with uh, Gandhi Jabinski and Ludwig Martel and, and other Polish pilots. And I was delighted to accept that honour on behalf of the team. So, so a, a couple of days after that, this letter turns up and this is what they say. During the war, we received a letter from Franek via Holland. He let us know about the dispatch of two other letters and some money. Only one of those letters reached us. Via Portugal, we received parcels from him known as signs of life, containing tins of sardines. Our joy was not for the food, but for the knowledge that, that the sender was still alive. Can you imagine our great joy? Those were the only happy moments in those cruel days. After the war ended, we received another parcel which made us happy because we assumed that Franek was still alive. But we waited in vain for him to come home. Finally, we asked the Red Cross to try and discover whether he was still alive. Eventually, we received confirmation that our dear brother had failed to return from operations in 1941 and was probably killed in the cold waters of the English Channel. We also received his medals and photographs. The news of this tragedy drove us all to the depths of despair. Since that time, more than 40 years have now passed and we are happy that Franek's memory is alive, not only with us. At our memory room in Gaddafi, his photograph is displayed in a place of honour. Also, you in faraway England have not forgotten him. We are so proud of our brother. We are also astonished at your achievements as such a young man and want to shake your hand for all you have done. Kindly express our gratitude to everybody who has contributed to the commemoration of Franek's sermon. We are most grateful to his friends, the chaplain and the people of England. It is hard to express our thanks in words. There are no words that could adequately express the feelings of two old people who have kept alive in their hearts the memory of their dear brother. Actually, breaking off, it's worth pointing out that the other sister was killed in a German bombing raid. So these are the two surviving sisters. Through your project, you have awakened our memories and shown how wonderful people can be. Many special thanks go to you and we will be praying for your success in life. Prayers for someone now very dear to us. May God take care of you and your organisation. We are so happy that there is still someone to light a candle for Franek on All Souls Day. We are happy because the memorial erected to him serves as his grave, a symbol he can see from heaven. We have always worried about Franek having no known grave, but now we are at peace, thanks to you. But it wasn't just me, and without Andy Long igniting this flame, possibly none of this would have happened. It was a team effort and there's no I in team. But one thing we do do every year, and I've done it religiously, a promise that I made those two old ladies, both of whom are now deceased, 
is to light a candle for Frannick on All Souls Day every November and I'll certainly be doing that this year. So that's the Frannick Surma story. That's the main thing that got me totally absorbed and obsessed with researching these very violent events from all those years ago, meeting the veterans, the survivors, the eyewitnesses, and collating all these first-hand accounts that now provide such a rich source of material. So uh, remember Frannick Surma and remember all of these people who gave their lives. And there's a story behind every single one that we really mustn't forget. So thanks again for listening. So this is our memorial to Flying Officer Frannick Surma in Jennet Tree Lane, Maddersfield, Worcestershire. And at the time it was unveiled by Battle of Britain Spitfire pilot, Squadron leaders Jabinski and Martel, it was the only memorial to an individual Polish fighter pilot in the UK. And we do know that we spelt his name wrong, but at the time we were only kids. Information was difficult to come by because Poland was behind the Iron Curtain. So in a way, that's part of the story. And that's why we decided not to amend it and to leave it. So his Spitfire crashed further down the lane, in the fields on the right, and Surma himself drifted by parachute across the lane and landed in the garden of the cottage on the junction of Hawthorne and Jennet Tree Lanes. And Vi Farrant, a land girl, was the first to Surma, caused concern that he may have been a German because of his accent, and he waited at nearby Bosworth Farm for transport back to Baggington Airfield and 308 Squadron. Sadly, he was killed in action and reported missing near Dunkirk six months later. So although he wasn't killed here, we felt because he was missing, he should have some kind of individual marker. And it's here in this beautiful place in the lee of the Malvern Hills, which inspired Algar's famous land of hope and glory. So what could be better?